Fixus Lab now offers handheld and inline devices capable of measuring fluorescent polymer. These new tag polymer devices compensate for color and turbidity, ensuring that your measurements are extremely accurate each and every time. No more worrying about color or turbidity interference. If you're using tag polymer in your system, measure with Pixis Lab. To find out more about Pixis Lab's full line of products, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash Pixis. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we scale up on our knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, your host for Scaling Up H2O, every industrial water treater's favorite podcast. Folks, I am so looking forward to seeing a select few of you when I'm going to be at the AWT technical training in just two weeks. Can't wait to see you there. Remember, again, if you were not one of the lucky people that won that lottery to get to go to that fantastic event, you can still get on the waiting list. And hopefully the waiting list will open up and you will be able to attend as well. Now, for those people that are attending, please find me. I won't be hard to find. I will be one of the instructors. No matter what class you take, I will be in front of you. I pull a lot of duties when I am at the AWT technical training. So no matter what course you take, I will be your instructor at one point or another. Please come up to me. Let me know what you think about the show. Let me know some ideas you have about the show. Let me know what the show has done for you. I tell you, when people come up and they say how scaling up H2O has either been their friend when they're driving to customer to customer, or they've been motivated to try something new, or they have an idea for the show, folks, I just get so excited about that. So please do not deny me of meeting you. I look forward to that. And folks, if you were not able to get into the AWT technical training this year, don't worry. I am very hopeful that all this stuff that we have been enduring for well over a year will soon start to go back to normal. I'm very hopeful of that. There might be some changes that we always have to deal with, but folks, Things are going to get back to more normal, and hopefully I will be able to see you if you weren't able to make it. Now, something I also want to see you on is we are doing a business webinar series in conjunction with the Association of Water Technologies. Folks, we work with a lot of associations. It just happens that we're talking about the AWT a lot today. But the AWT and Scaling Up H2O are working together to bring you Adam Lean, who is going to be talking about how to read your numbers in business. Folks, if you are in business, if you're running a territory, if you're running any aspect of the business, you should know what your numbers are telling you. And I know numbers can be very intimidating. I really know that because I teach math at the technical training seminars we just talked about. But when you take your company's numbers and you're able to apply what you're trying to do to what is actually happening, folks, that is data that you just can't replace with anything else. When I work with people at that level, I noticed more often than not, people are very intimidated of their numbers. So they don't look at their numbers at all. Folks, there's just so much data that your numbers can tell you. And Adam is going to give us tools to allow us to use our numbers. And instantly, right there after the webinar, you will be able to do something with those numbers. And his presentation is all designed around getting you healthier and making sure that you are ready for growth. I've known Adam for some time now, and Adam just has a way of making very complex CPA-type stuff seem very simple. So you don't want to miss that. That's going to be May 28th at 11 Eastern Time, 11 a.m. I'm not going to keep you up 
to 11 p.m. Don't worry about that. If you want to register for that, and why wouldn't you want to register for that? You can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash business. Everything you want to know about the webinar and upcoming webinars are on that page. I hope to see you there. And folks, one more thing. It is not going to be a boring webinar. We're going to put you in breakout rooms. So you're actually going to get to meet some people. You're going to be able to work on something. And the information that Adam shares, you'll be able to practice right there in the breakout room. So when you end that webinar, when you sign off the webinar, you'll be able to hit the road running. I can't wait to see you May 28th from 11 to 1. Scout Up Nation, there is no doubt about it. One of my proudest accomplishments is being able to come to you each and every week as the host of Scaling Up H2O. And when I look at our schedule and see that we are getting ready for episode 200, I am just humbled. Thank you so much for listening to Scaling Up H2O each and every week. But more than that, you've given us ideas, you've given us guests to talk to, and because of you, we're going to have another 200 successful episodes. Well, folks, we want to celebrate you on episode 200. So let us know what the show has done for you. Let us know what your favorite show is. Let us know something that you feel you need to reach out and let the staff of the Scaling Up H2O podcast know about your experience and the show. We can't wait to hear those, and I can't wait to share those with the Scaling Up Nation on episode 200. Go to scalinguph2o.com and record your voice, and folks, we're going to celebrate 200 together. Nation, one of the things I try to do on this show is bring you information about new technologies. Well, we're kind of doing that today, but I don't know how new it is. We're going to be talking about tannins. I've received a lot of questions about tannins, and we're going to talk about this in the interview. But the simple fact is tannins were the original water treatment chemistry. So I don't know how new they are, but maybe we're using them in a new way. So ladies and gentlemen of the Scaling Up Nation, please welcome my guest, Louis Cloutier. Today, my lab partner is Louis Cloutier of TGWT. Welcome, Louis. Hi, Trace. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O. And I remember when I met you years ago at an Association of Water Technologies conference, and you told me what TGWT stood for. I knew that you were just a cool guy and it was just a cool company. Can you share with the Scaling Up Nation what that stands for? <laughs> yeah, that's a part of the subject we're going to talk today. So TGWT stands for Tannin Guys Water Treatment. So I just think that's cool. I, I, did you guys have like 20 names you were deciding from? How did you, how did you decide? <laughs> I mean, it says exactly what you do. How did you land on that? We started the company at first, and uh, the name was Servivap for Service Vapeur, so in French is Steam Services, and it was not working in English. And, and when we went to AWT for the first time, I think it was around 2010, um, people were, you know, we were meeting people here and there, and people who were telling us, oh, we know who you are, you're the Tannen guys. So... We said, why not uh, adopt that name and change the company name? And that's what we have did in 2012. So it became Tannin Guys Water Treatment. I love it because it gets right down to the point. It tells you exactly what you need to know. And I think that's what this episode is going to be. I think today we're talking about Tannin, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, Louis, so many people talk about Tannin as if it's a new technology, but wasn't it the original water treatment chemistry? Exactly. And um, I don't know if you ever met uh, Louis uh, Godbu, the head of our R&D, another Louis, but uh, we, we like to call him uh, Wiki Louis. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's been looking back in, in many, many things. And he, he found the first, uh, let's say, paper. It's, it's dated back 79 AD. 
And it was the first uh, chemical test ever described uh, for the complexation of iron with tannin. But let's say, to be a little less on the geek side, <laughs> the, in the industrial water world, it, it did arrive mostly around 1850s to treat uh, steam boilers. Now, you can disprove this because I've heard it. I don't know if it's true or not. I heard that tannin came around and really water treatment came about where people would get water from rivers, lakes, streams, and it would have wood floating in it. And the, the water that had more what we know now as tannin in it did better in the boiler. And that's how they first started treating boilers. Is that a true story? Yeah, that's part true story, and we can still see it today at some of the accounts we're treating where there's tannin in the river where we have to take it in account where we do our, our testing. But um, yeah, I, I, the, the, the story I heard that was quite in, in line with what you just said is with some train line in the USA, you know, some of them were taking the water from a water tank in galvanized steel, and some other one were taking the water with uh, a tank made out of wood, mainly chestnut wood. And, and these trains were going on for a longer time without having to go through maintenance and everything. And, and someone figured that out at one point. And also, I think the, across the 20th century, the British and American navies, the tannin was their treatment of choice. In fact, the American navies think it was up till 1995 in their, their guidelines. Fascinating. I love figuring out where all the stuff that we're doing now really came from. You know, before we get back into our tanning conversation, would you mind telling the Scaling Up Nation a little bit about yourself? Yes, and uh, that's maybe a little part of, of why we, did, we were able to do it and make it a success. You know, I, I just... Um, I started in, in my career um, working part-time and uh, doing my my university degree. And I was working at the Renault Depot, who's a bit the equivalent of Home Depot here in the marketing department. And then I graduated from the business uh, school university here called HEC Montreal. It's the largest one, the largest French one th in, in Canada. And the... Uh, so my degree is in international business, but I did all my high school mostly on the science side. And I started university on the science side, and then I switched to inter international business. So I kind of got both things in me. And um, the first five years uh, after that, I, I did the work helping Canadian and U.S. company to um, set up either a research partnership in France or even open plants or offices. So I was able to meet a lot of different people from many, many different industry, high tech industry. So by doing that, I discovered water treatment and I discovered also everything that was about tannin. And then I looked around and I, I see what was uh, on the market. And then I decided to, to launch the company in 2005 uh, seeing that tannin was way different than, than what was on the market at the time. And, and then I started to grow and grow. And then I needed some private equity. So I did a, a, fi a financing round and I was able to get some private equity in. And then I also became two times um, a corn that is a German company that are our our technology partner on Tannin also became shareholders of TGWT. So that was a, a really nice journey through that. And I uh, had the chance also to study in France during my university. There's a kind of a French, uh, French line over here, but it was not, I, I went to France mainly because it was uh, in Grenoble. So it's right in the middle of the Alps. And uh, yeah, the, my little uh, leisure, favorite leisure is to do downhill skiing. Really? Yeah. So that's why I, I'm working also with uh, like uh, companies like uh, FCT in Colorado. I'm only aiming at the mountains. No, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but uh, I have the, the, the chance to have uh, um, customers uh, in, in North America everywhere and in Europe. So I can also mix the skiing with my, my job. So that's great. That's how to do it. You know, I remember, geez, it was five, six years ago. I got the pleasure. My wife and I went to Quebec City. Hands down, 
the friendliest, cleanest place I have ever visited. <laughs> oh, that's that's a good word. Yeah, it's uh, when people come to Montreal. Montreal, a bit more similar than than other um, North American city. There's a historic part to it that's quite unique. But then when you go to Quebec City, Quebec City is really really charming, and on the just on the verge of the Saint Lawrence River, and and it's quite also um, the hills going down to the river. So it's yeah, you're right. It's a, a really really nice city. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, my, my wife was trying to practice her French and, and, you know, in the South, we say, bless your heart. But she was doing her best. And she had she apologized to this one lady that was in the store. And she said, no, no, please talk to me in English. I really want the opportunity to practice. And we just thought that was fantastic. Yeah, that's the unique part. You know, sometimes people come in Canada, they do Toronto some and then they, they think they've seen it all. But the fact that, uh, let's say, just Montreal, the city by itself is 3 million people and 1.5 are English and 1.5 are French. And then the rest of the state is mostly French. So it brings a unique a unique twist to, uh, to uh, the North American life. Compare maybe the rest of Canada is a bit more similar to, to any other U.S. states, maybe. Well, Nation, if you're listening and you're trying to figure out a vacation spot, I highly recommend Quebec City. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's nice in the winter or in the summer. Both both seasons are nice, uh, different things to see. Just a bigger winter coat to wear. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get back to our original conversation. So if somebody just joined and they have no idea what tannin is, how would you describe it to them? Yeah, tannins comes from uh, it's an, a natural extract. Uh, you can there's uh, over three thousand species identified. Uh, the one we're using come from the bark of trees. So um, two things uh, we've talked a bit about the history of tannin and how people in the nineties uh, or maybe seventies or nineties let let it go in their product line, and that's where we did figure out with our German partners how to purify them. Because if you look at the 3,000 species, it's a natural product. So so everything's natural, it has some impurities, and, and some of the tannin species can have up to 70% of impurities. And some of these impurities are sugar. So you probably know that you don't want sugar in a boiler. So uh, So once you figure out which species are the best to go against corrosion, to disperse, to to do the proper job under pressure and temperature. Then you select the species and then you purify them. And that's how we arrive to our product that we like to call purified tannins. Now, what types of systems do tannins go in? The one that uh, we have the most installation in, in North America is steam boilers and in Europe. But uh, we also use uh, tannin on closed loop, either eating closed loop or cooling closed loop. Just the cooling closed loop that are really a closed loop, not a, a closed and open loop, because tannin, like I was saying, will fix oxygen. So if it's a, a loop that I have an open tank, usually it's not the best in that case. But yeah, that's the two application we're using it for, steam boilers and, and closed loops. I know a lot of people listening are servicing food accounts where they can only bring so many products in. They have to have some sort of special label on them saying that they're safe to work with food. Is tannin a good choice for that? Yes, uh, we have that, that question uh, all the time. Uh, the, um, there's two or three um, sides to that answer. Yeah, if you look in the FDA uh, regulation, the tannins are there and, and there's no limitation to it. So, so it's really uh, compliant on, on FDA. We're also kosher. And uh, it, yeah, the FDA part is also direct contact with food. We have two blends, one that is only tannin and one that is tannin and ammonia. And we decided also to go with ammonia because it's uh, also uh, the only one that is tolerated in the dairy industry. But maybe the last part is the yeah USDA or, or organic certification. 
it's a bit of a gray zone uh, for the border product because they they tend to overlook at it, but it's not really in the regulation. So we were able to get some registration, let's say with Pennsylvania certified organic, and we're in a process to get a certification from a a, a broader organization called Omri, the uh, Organic Material Review Institute. So it's one of the large one, let's say, overseeing the organic certification in U.S. and Canada. So I'm, I'm curious, how does the tannin chemistry work? You know, at AWT, we're always talking about how sulfite works and all the other stuff. How does tannin work? Yeah, um, that, that's uh, that's also a good question. We did pu- uh, presented uh, over time a couple conference at AWT, and some of them were also published in the the analyst. But uh, let's say if you look at the tannin by themselves, they replace the two products that you're using. They replace your sulfite, and they will replace your polymer slash dispersant that you're going to use. So, so if you look at tannin, there's a, a a tropolone group to it, and that group will will take care of scavenge oxygen. And if you look at the reaction curve of tannin and oxygen, it's uh, really, really a, uh, almost a copy of the the catalyzed sulfide curve. It will react faster with pH and faster with temperature. So it's really, really similar in that that fact. And you're going to use a little less tannin to do the same job as the sulfide. For the polymer part, tannin have the, uh, the 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 property to to disperse and avoid deposition in a boiler, but it's one also of the the only boiler product that will also have an effect on chelating chelating on the surface. So it, it will. Um, that was the last paper we did at AWT last year. We were able to prove that tannin will interlink with the magnetite and form a, a thinner and, and more robo- robust film on metal than, than the usual because conventional product will create the right environment for the magnetite film to form, but it will they won't have any effect on the magnetite itself, you know. So and when you look at how magnetite behave, it's going to, at one point, larger crystals are pushing out and, and you're going to have exposed surface from time to time all over the boiler. You know, it's just a, a continuous movement. Everything's going to be covered back. But uh, And when you add tannin to that mix, the film is really even on the surface and, and you really need to scrub it off if you, if you want to get rid of it. And then the the last part is condensate treatment. So some of the people in US use tannin to replace polymer and sulfide, and they keep their amines to treat their condensate. But we also have, a, like I was telling earlier, a product that's all in one where we add ammonia, and then ammonia will treat will be the part that will be volatile in the steam to treat the condensate. And and why we picked uh, ammonia for dairies, but also because the distribution ratio of ammonia is, is one of the highest. So it's a, a true um, product that's working really well in almost all environments. Where's the ideal place to feed tannin? <laughs> it would be uh, where you feed your sulfite. So in the deaerator or in your feed tank. And with sulfite, we're always looking at a feed water temperature of about 180, 190. Of course, the deaerator that has to be working right. I'm assuming the same things apply for tannin as well. Exactly, because they they behave really similarly. So the the warmer the water is, the faster the reaction will be. And in fact, let's say uh, we we're seeing it too. If you have an installation where temperature is 110, because they either don't preheat the feed tank or or it's broken, then tannins are more expensive than sulfide just to do that. So that, that will be a, a part where temperature are, is maybe even a little more important than sulfide. How do you test for tannin? There's two or three things. The, some people are, <laughs> over time, I've tried the, the out-of-the-shell generic test you know, to to test our tannin, and it's not working well for our tannin. So there's two ways we, we were, were doing it. 
One is we came out with an absorbance curve on all the, the different color meters. So uh, we can give you the curve for a hack device, a lovey bond, a Pixis, and uh, we can program it into it and, and tailor also. So uh, so then you, you're going to do your zero. Then you're going to take your border water, filtrate it through a point. 22 micron filter and then put it in the in the color meter and then you'll have a reading and what you're going to read on on that meter the target for a clean border is 175 and and when you have scale it will be 225 the other part where it's smaller accounts we have just a, a regular color comparison test where we print here in our office and send it to our distributor a, a laminated page with three different color, too low, too high, and the right zone. And we are giving them the glass bottle that is the same we took in the picture. And for a small installation, you know, the uh, the color meter tried to re- reproduce what the human eyes is seeing. For a small installation, it's, it's really good enough to, to test. Well, lots of great information about Tannin, and I'm sure people are thinking this. What are some of the reasons that we need to consider changing from a typical chemistry over to tannin? There is multiple advantage. Let's say uh, the, the the green part of it. It's uh, if you just compare toxicity of uh, the different three products compared to one and the content of every product. That's maybe a, a good step to to go for a, a greener chemistry. Then you you'll have reduced uh, o, OHS risk handling less product and handling a product that's less hazardous. And uh, the main thing is our purified tannin, let's say compared to the tannin that, that probably some of your audience did know in the past, we're able to increase cycles in steam borders. So usually we're able to triple cycles. So that means that we're going to be able to reduce the blowdown by 50 to 80 percent. We're going to be uh, able to reduce the energy consumption and uh, the greenhouse gas emission from 1% to 5%, and the water, the makeup water usage from 8 to 20%. So uh, it's quite interesting to, to do that uh, for you as uh, bringing that to your customer, and then the, the compliance are, are higher and higher to reduce the, the consumption of water and energy, so it, it fits right in. So concentrating the boiler water so much, do you get to a point where you're exceeding the ASME and uh, American Boiler Manufacturer Association guidelines? Most of the time, yes, we do. There could be also a middle target where m- most of the other product don't, uh, let's say, maximize the ASME limits. They, they're about halfway through the limits. So just going to the limit, usually you can double your cycle. And that's usually where we start. You know, the first month, people increase cycles, increase conductivity slowly. And they could see that all the parameters are stable. You know, the steam quality is staying the same. The boiler water will be quite translucent. Uh, The only difference is that there will be a a whiskey or a, a sweet tea color depending on your reference <laughs> and uh, you you'll make uh, you'll see that and usually the customer or the water treater that've been using it for the first time because it's so different so, so different then they'll take confidence in the product and that's where they're going to push a little higher and it's it's a, a matter of of cycle also because we've got some feed mills that are running at 35,000 in conductivity and we're not changing any parameters. We've got some here, a large uh, pulp and paper mill on just biomass border. So you would agree not the fastest to react. And they're running at 300 cycles in the border. And their steam quality is uh, eight micromoles. So uh, it's quite amazing. What are the typical operating parameters of a steam boiler operating on tannin? Uh, I would say if you take... What's what we see that is the most usual. So you have soft water coming in. And if you have uh, city water or something, the soft water conductivity would be 200 to 50 to 300 uh, with maybe hardness at 120 ppm. It's all it, it, it's like any border treatment 
you need to have softened water after that. But let's say you're at 100 in your feed tank, we're going to aim at, at uh, 10,000 and, and reach 100 cycles in the boiler. So that's the usual uh, application, let's say. Are there any known issues with using tannin? There's known issues. There's maybe um, two ways I can answer that. There's part that if you have a lot of carryover in your plants before starting the tannin, because if you've been treating boilers, you know that, I don't know, two maybe or three out of 10 will have some mechanical issues. Pressure drop, when the, when the pressure is dropping more than four PSI, then you change your boiling point and, and you'll carry water in your steam. So some of the accounts were doing it for years and they never noticed it or even worse, you know, not to talk against the, the large water treaters, but some of them don't even ask to test test the, the condensate quality. So, so if you're aware to start with that there's a lot of carryover, you better fix the mechanical issue before starting because like I was saying, the color will be kind of a whiskey color. So, so usually you don't want that color in your steam. That could be also an, an advantage on the other side, because if you didn't know that was happening, the color will really help you to find these mechanical problems. One of the story I like to talk about that was uh, we started a, a dairy that was doing evaporated milk. And then... Uh, across the first month, they call me and and they say, uh, "Hey, Louis, we have a problem. We see red water in our like butter tub, and we don't we don't like that." I said, "Yeah, I don't like it too." And then uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, I, I stood uh, on my side that tannin chemically cannot carry over in steam. And then we looked. I, I was lucky because they have a, a really good uh, and knowledgeable operators. And we, we did look at the process thoroughly and, and they found out that, um, you know, when you do evaporated milk, you need one pound of steam to evaporate one pound of milk, but then it's costly. So if you want to increase that, you're going to put the, the milk side under vacuum. So then a pound of steam will give you more than a pound of milk, you know. So by doing that, they had three different lines they were that was on vacuum. And uh, they didn't notice, and it did happen for, for a couple of years before, but they, they had some panels in one of the production line. So when that line was switching on, they were pulling, sucking water out of the boiler to that line. So before noticing it, because of the tannin color, they used to run three vacuum pumps, uh, full load, 24 hours a day. And once they they find that problem, then they were only running two pumps and 50% load. So so that was kind of a, a bonus saving for them. But uh, uh, that's, to, to come back to your question, that's the part where people sometimes are afraid as soon as they see color. And it's always mechanical. But sometimes people, you know, you need to go through that phase where where people are a bit more afraid and, and then work with them to find where it's coming from. Louis, can you overfeed the product? You can do that. The only sad person will be the one paying because, uh, yeah, tannin per pounds are more expensive. But we did publish uh, a paper on, um, a couple of years ago at AWT where we did prove that you know, you need a certain amount to cover the surface, but once that part is done, then any tannin you'll add to it will not do a multi-layer film on boilers. It will just be wasted, uh, you know. So you can increase a bit of dosage if you know if you have scale or corrosion because tannin will help you get rid of scale of corrosion because it's reacting with oxygen I was talking about, but it's also reacting with hardness so it will go after that hardness part in the buildup and maybe to complement on, on your question where it's not working usually as uh, conventional water treaters we learn that like you said don't put too much product and if you want to descale a product then you need to go slowly to make sure uh, you're not creating any chips especially in water tubes boiler and if you do that with tannin, you'll go to a, a failure almost for sure. So, so you have to 
listen to the manufacturer, so TGWT recommendation, and then increase the tannin level. So if you, instead of the 175 I was talking, if you go to 225, so about 30% more, then you'll make sure to put all the buildups into solution and everything will go out through the bottom and surface blowdown. And then you'll have a, a tremendous inspection. But if you're cheaping on it, there, then there's not enough tannin because it's a multifunction molecule. So to go after oxygen, to coat the surface, and then to descale the boiler, then you won't have enough. And that's where you can see chips happening if you, if you don't put enough. Back in the day, I remember my dad would descale a boiler using EDTA, and he would discontinue the phosphate feed when he was feeding EDTA, and he was always testing for phosphate in the boiler to see when to stop the EDTA. So when, as the scale was liberating off, it was also liberating phosphate, and he was able to test that in his system. Are there any tricks like that when we're using tannin to descale? There's a bit, uh, just uh, if you look at the RSDS, you, you'll notice that, but there, there's a bit of EDTA in the product. We're able, since the, all the study we published, we were able to, to prove that that protective film is so strong that, that if we're adding a bit of EDTA to our mix, we can have it as an insurance policy because you were saying when we increase cycles in a boiler, yes, you're outside of the norm. So if you're let's say your softeners are suddenly breaking up or there's hardness going through, then you need a bit of that EDTA to make sure to, to be able to face that upset in hardness. But back to the descaling question, we have did it with larger accounts, uh, again, in the pulp and paper industry because we have many, uh, we're treating many of large pulp and paper mills where we did a pre-inspection and we could see clearly that there was a lot of scale in their boilers, so we can do transport studies. So there's two ways. Uh, you can either send us sample and we, we're going to help you to figure out how much scale you're taking out of the boiler. Or since most of your audience are, are knowledgeable water treaters, we can uh, teach them how to do it and they... They, they have to take the color out of the water for the tannin to measure the, to, the, the trans, to do the transport study. And the only way that is important is to reduce your, your tannin consumption once you, the, most of the scale is gone. Because if you continue to, let's say, put double the dosage of tannin in line with your previous question, it won't create any chemical problem except uh, being a bit too expensive. So, Louis, you own a water treatment company that happens to provide products of tannin to other water treaters. But that being said, you could use anything you want in your water treatment arsenal, but all you use is tannin, correct? Exactly. So, yeah, w when we started the business in 2005, I only had tannins on my shelves. And it's been like this ever since. So some people are asking me, where does it work? And it's not working here since it was always our only option. We have small and large customer, agri-food, uh, hospital, university, uh, pulp and paper, textile, chemicals. So any type of application usually can work, except uh, the thing I was telling you, if you know there's carryover, maybe I would avoid it. And the other part is uh, we started as a water treatment company here in, in Quebec, in the Quebec state or province, and, and then we expand a bit in Ontario because it's the next state. But at one point, we were growing fast, and, and like you said, uh, Trace, we met at AWT uh, almost 10 years ago, and we needed to uh, team up with people in the U.S. because we started our first sale in the U.S. in 2008. And it was a subsidiary of uh, two large, one subsidiary and one uh, supplier of our, a large account we had here in Quebec. So they were based in South Carolina. And that's where we met John Harrelson, that was the owner of uh, AJ Chemical at the time. And uh, he sold AJ Chemical to Cruff. And uh, we started to work with John, and that's where we learned about AWT. And we said, what, how about, you know, instead of trying to push our own sales force, partner up with the AWT member outside of Quebec and Ontario. So I like to keep that 
water treatment part because we're hands on. So, so we're servicing direct account, we're developing sales, we're approaching prospects, uh, doing monthly service visit. And that's really important for me because then when I speak to business owner like you, Trace, I know what I'm talking about. And if you're coming up with some issues, usually we've been already working on it or already have a solution because we're going through the same daily uh, task or weekly task as you are. We have so many different types of water treaters that listen to this podcast. Some have been in the industry for years. Some have been in the industry for days. Is there a certain amount of skill set that's needed to properly deliver a tannin program? Yeah, the, the, there's a fun part to that because I heard from some of our distributor in USA that for their new team members, like the new water treaters, by the way, congrats on choosing this career because uh, it's quite uh, amazing. But uh, yeah, they, they, they're, they're telling that they only train the new guys on Tannin because it's easier to learn only one product, only one test only than it is to learn the conventional chemistries and, and all the adjustment and titration needed to be successful. And I would say in my own team, I, I've got people that maybe some of you met at AWT, like uh, Melanie, uh, where she did started with us and she, she only knew tannin in her life. So if you ever uh, ask her about <laughs> sulfite or polymer test, she, she doesn't even know how to do it. And, and she doesn't know why she should do it because she, she preferred tannins. Well, that's interesting. And I can't agree more. The best career out there. I, I don't know why anybody would do anything else besides water treatment. <laughs> Louis, what's one of your biggest success stories? Uh, I would say, first of all, uh, it, it's related, you know, to, to, I think, to start completely new in the uh, water treatment world is something that I was not expecting, maybe the, the conservative part and to be able to gain confidence through that sector. And in line with that, you know, the first pulp and paper mills that we ever got into was uh, Cascade. Maybe, you know, Cascade, they do uh, uh, over 4 billion in turnover and they have over 14,000 employees. So it's quite a big one. And, and their tagline is uh, green by nature. So they were one of the first maybe organization to ever push the recycling part and, and, and reducing water. So that was kind of a natural fit for them to try us. And it was back in 2006. So we were only a, a one-year company with three people into it. So if you know a bit the business, usually they only work with uh, the, the big water treaters and even people that are, have 100, 200 employees are too small to go in pulp and paper. And so we did make the cut. We got a first plant and then we convinced them to get a second plant. And then by 2009, we were treating four of their plants and, and uh, one of them was doing one billion pound of steam per year. So, so really, really large border. And that was at that time in 2009 that we needed some venture capital to, to sustain our growth. So um, we had the chance to sit down with uh, the owner of Cascade that are called the Lemaire Brothers. And they're really close to uh, another group called, uh, it was called uh, La Peria Vero or Au Vivo later on and owned by Laurent Vero. So uh, we sat down with them and uh, I convinced them to, to become shareholder of TGWT because they could save on water and energy on their side. And by investing on, on in our company, they can also make money out of our growth. So I would say that's maybe the, my, my best success story. And now I've been treating 12 or, or plants of Cascade and we're still putting new one online uh, every year. So that's, that, that's clearly a, one of my biggest success. If someone just joined the podcast right now, what is the one point that you want to make clear today? Yeah, we've been talking for uh, for the last uh, uh, half an hour or more on, on tannin, and uh, I would say m more than than selling tannin, the the hard part about tannin or any new thing is is to s how how hard it is maybe to sell a new technology. So there's always really good upside. But you need to grow go through the first hurdles where uh, people will 
either not believe it. Everyone's afraid of change to different extent. So, so tannin is is a, a major change. So you you have to make sure that if you ever do it, you're with them to train the team and, and be next to them for the first year. And then after that, probably it will be easier and you'll have less time to spend. And it's the same thing for me when we start a new war treatment partner in the U.S. I make sure on the first year that we have the open line that we can answer all the questions. And the, all the questions are good, you know, and any any little fear is, is good to worth uh, a talk. And uh, to help that also, we build a platform called Close It. So... Uh, so it's helping. All the calculation are based on AWT, the books from Colin Frayne, uh, the Sparax Sarco calculation. Uh, in fact, we're also certifying it, uh, having it certified by a third party, but it's showing you clearly when you put tan in the border and you increase cycles, all the different area in a border room where you're going to see a change. And, and when, when it's going to happen. And, and usually that's the base to a discussion and that's the base to the support we can give the first year. You've been a water trader for a while, so I, I really want to ask this question. What's the weirdest water treatment story you have? <laughs> yeah, there, there's a couple of them, but let's say a quick one would be uh, I was going to take a sample of a closed loop in the office building and that loop was never treated before. So uh, we looked and looked, and there was no, no good spot to take a sample. So um, uh, we had to open kind of an uh, air bleed vent at one point. And for sure, uh, when you manipulated air vent, it's going to send water quite uh, fast and quite far. So I got droplets of, of that closed loop never been treated on my forearms. And instantly, I got some red rash and some some little things growing on my my forearms. So uh, so that was quite freaky. Yikes! <laughs> I've ruined shirts. I've never had anything grow on me. So I guess that's why we always got to be careful. Yeah, kind of little bumps, like, like like really a skin reaction, immediate skin reaction to what was in that loop. And then, of course, you treated it, and it's it's the best water on the planet, right? <laughs> no, we just uh, run away from it because they didn't really <laughs> care. So <laughs> when we saw that, we said, no, we're not going to, if you're not serious about it, uh, we're not going to work here. Understood. Pick your battles. Well, speaking of picking battles, the next battle that we've got to look through is the lightning round. So are you ready to answer those questions? Yes, I am, Trace. <laughs> all right. So these are the same questions I ask of all my guests. So the first question is, if you could go back in time and talk to your former self on your first day as a water treater, what advice would you give yourself? Run away and don't look back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, maybe on my side, you know, I'm a water treater, but I, I also created the business at the same time. I would say maybe the importance of, uh, of keeping the innocence, you know, to face adversities. Because if I knew that the war treatment was so conservative, conventional, and uh, the people, even either customers or war treater were so conservative, probably I would have chosen another path. But then joining the industry and, and going from step to step, it was clearly not a straight line to success, but it was... Uh, was worth the trip. So keeping that, let's say, uh, innocence on thinking that tomorrow will be the best next day, and uh, and and that we can you can face everything. That's that's I think a key key advice. What are the last few books that you've read? Uh, I can give you maybe two on business and one uh, one maybe more leisure. But uh, yeah, I read. Uh, and I keep coming back to it, scaling up, uh, not your podcast, but the book by Vern Arnish, you know, on the Rockefeller habits. Know that very well. So, uh, so yeah, so we're doing the Gazelle methodology for our, our business plan and our, our strategic plan. So we go back to that. And uh, I read this kind of complementary to it lately, another uh, book called Playing to Win. I don't know if you ever read that. I'm not familiar with that one. 
that one was uh, written by A.G. Laffley, who used to be the former chairman and CEO of Procter and Gamble, and Roger Martin, who's uh, the dean at the Rotman School of Management. And they were working together to make a lot of the Procter and Gamble growth and success. So uh, once I've read that, I kind of combined uh, the knowledge of this with uh, the Vernarnish uh, method, because in playing to win, for sure, they're talking about really large corporation. But maybe the the word are a bit better in the the way to describe instead of. Uh, a uh, big area audacious goal is uh, you're playing to win. Where do you play? How would you win? What is your competition? So it, it's, I think the the way to describe it is a little easier for a team to identify to their own reality. Yeah, I love that. I love taking books and kind of compounding them on each other to fit what works for your company. That's a great idea. And maybe just a, a fiction novel called Saga. Uh, it was uh, quite fun. Uh, yeah, giving uh, g- was given to me, and and there's a, a bit of a, could be something uh, in line with what I I've done in the business, just on the the moral of the the book. But it's about uh, a team of screenwriter that that are hired for a night show, and uh, they have to book that that night show let's say from three to four in the morning and they so they they take people that are not really known or identified as b or c people and they take five four of them and they say yeah i wrote that tv show we have to book that that spot in the night and we're paid for that and so since they had no boundaries and they have people were was not uh, expecting anything then they created the one of the the, the largest TV show in in the state, so that was, so so that was quite a, a fun story to read. When they make a movie about your life, who plays Louis? <laughs> that, that's a good one. I have to to think about it a bit, but I would say maybe Ewan McGregor, not just because he has he has a beard, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think is uh, maybe. Uh, versatility he did sci-fi and i love star wars and and some more funny movie like train spotting but also um i don't know if you saw that on apple tv lately but uh it was his third kind of documentary and it's called a long way up so he's taking his motorcycle from south uh, america up to uh, los angeles so, and he's sharing that trip with one of his best friends. I would say his love of motorcycle and friendship also would fit the the, the character. <laughs> Great answer. My last question, you now have the ability to talk to anybody throughout history, who to be with and why. Uh, yeah, I would say, and uh, if I go a little further, uh, my first idea was Richard Branson, but he's still alive. So he's still in history, so I can still maybe, maybe try to make it happen. But uh, yeah, I, I like the fact that he's uh, what he's done with Virgin, the way he started the company and, and how he kept the employee at the core of everything he, he does and the respect for its employee and customer also. And also, uh, I think keeping a, a fun factor to everything he did that was either serious or less serious. So think that that would be it. Well, I think you're doing a lot of those things with Tannen. <laughs> thank you. Well, and thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O. I think we all know a little bit more about Tannen Technologies. Thank you, Trace. And again, before leaving, congratulations for scaling up. Uh, you're making uh, all of us who are treated more knowledgeable one podcast at a time. Nation, if you've ever had any experience with the people at TGWT, you know that they are some of the friendliest people on the planet. You cannot call them and not smile. They're they're amazing. So, Louis, thanks for coming on Scaling Up H2O once again. And thank you for sharing so much information about 
tannin. As an industrial water treater, we need to know the different options that we have available to us because all of our customers have unique needs. When we have an arsenal of different approaches that we can take to achieve industrial water treatment perfection or as close as we can get to it, we are able to better meet that customer's needs. So once again, just another tool that we can put in that arsenal. Nation, as you have come to expect each and every week, James McDonald is coming on the podcast and he is challenging us with a new challenge. So once again, here is James McDonald. Hello, Scaling Up Nation. The next James's challenge as we grow as an industrial water treatment professional, drop by drop, is... Question every chemical product you use at each location to ensure they are the best choice for the application. Did you inherit the chemical program from the last person who managed your water account? How do you know the correct chemicals were chosen for the application? Have circumstances changed, such as a change in makeup water quality, increase in heat load, or new metallurgies being added to the system? Are there new chemical technologies that better fit the need? It's always better for you and the customer to consider this first before someone else comes in and does it for you. Be sure to share your experience on LinkedIn by tagging it with hashtag JC21 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O. This is James McDonald, and I look forward to seeing what you share. There you go, another challenge. Each and every week, James is going to give us a brand new challenge. As I've mentioned earlier on the show, if you have not been keeping up, don't worry, you can always catch up. But here's what I ask. Please share what you're doing with one of the hashtags that James mentioned, hashtag JC21 and hashtag scaling up H2O. When you do that, you inspire other people. And folks, I really enjoy seeing how everybody is doing the challenge. Last week was a lot of fun. James challenged us to take apart a chemical dosing pump and hopefully put it back together so it works. I know a lot of you did that, and a lot of you had questions about that. I urge you to use the valuable vendors that we have in our industry. We are so fortunate to have some of the best water treatment equipment vendors out there that are servicing our industry. So folks, if you have not reached out to them and asked questions about the equipment that you are using, you are missing a golden opportunity. So if you don't know who your representative is, call your company, ask who it is, they would love to hear from you. Speaking of loving to hear from you, I would love to hear what you would like to hear on this show. One of my favorite television shows of all time was Mike Rowe's Dirty Jobs. And if you remember, he had in the very first season, I think enough for eight or 10 episodes where he was actually coming up with the Dirty Jobs. After that, he was out of material and he begged at the end of every episode for the viewers to let him know what Dirty Jobs were out there. I can't remember how many seasons that show was on, but that show was on because the audience gave him ideas. And I have to tell you, that is a fantastic show. If you haven't seen that, I'm pretty sure you can stream that on whatever streaming service Discovery has now, but it is a great show. And I am following Mike's lead. It worked well for him. It's working well for the Scaling Up Nation. So if you have an idea, if you have a guest, if you have something you want me to talk about on Scaling Up H2O, don't keep that to yourself. Let me know what that is. Another thing I will ask that you do is that you tell your fellow water treaters about Scaling Up H2O. Now, let me tell you, if there is somebody that is not familiar with podcasts and you know who they are, 
that's okay. You might have to help them load a podcast player and get them to subscribe to the show. I promise you, if you do that, they will be forever grateful. And the more people we get in the Scaling Up Nation, the better the Scaling Up H2O podcast can serve that nation. Folks, I can't wait to serve you again next week on a brand new episode of Scaling Up H2O. Scaling Up Nation, I'm going to let you in on a secret. When I decided to start the Rising Tide Mastermind in January of 2020, I was a little nervous because I didn't know all of the things that were going to happen because they hadn't happened yet. Now being so far into each group, I am just so impressed with the members who have joined and I wanted to ask some of them what were some of the things that they really enjoyed as a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. Trace does a really great job bringing new material, um, bringing a different format, throwing a little curveball at us. Um, it helps us almost not to expect what's coming, but then also we do have an agenda. so you kind of get the best of both worlds. I personally feel like I get a multiple of value back for what I invest in the Rising Tide Mastermind. And uh, I'm incredibly uh, grateful for the group. I'm glad I decided to commit to it. And I can't foresee a day when I'm not going to be a group like this, uh, at least not anytime soon. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing that. I have to tell you, one of my favorite things to do is to try to turn things upside down during a conversation so we get all vantage points of an issue. I've been taught that by my mentor on how to do that in facilitating groups. That's what Chris mentioned earlier that you just heard from. And I tell you, that is to make the member think a little bit differently, to see the situation a little bit differently so we can get a different vantage point. Folks, when we can change our perspective of how we see an issue, that's where major change happens. That's where we can come up with ideas that we could have never had before. We have to make sure we're changing our minds about what we thought we thought, and then we can make significant strides to not only solving that issue, but even finding out that that issue was just a symptom of another issue. I hope that this sounds like something that you want to become a part of. And to do that, you just need to go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to find out what you need to do to see if this is the right group for you.